Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. I want to thank our in-person audience and all of our virtual guests as well this morning. So a formal good morning to members of the Boston University community, guests, and friends of BU. My name is Amanda Bailey. I'm Vice President for Human Resources here at BU. And we're pleased to welcome you to today's event, the third of an Innovation to Action series. Today's topic, chat, GPT, and HR, the next workplace frontier. A little bit of background about this event and why we are here. We all know how quickly and rapidly the world of work is changing for not only our existing workforce, but for future employees as well. The Innovation to Action series was established to offer insights to the BU community that raise awareness and can inform how we advance new ways of thinking about the nature of work in a very rapidly changing work environment. Today's event is being brought to you by the Office of Human Resources, the Office of the Senior Diversity Officer, and the Center for Computing and Data Sciences. Now, a few housekeeping items as we move on. For our in-person audience, please take a few moments to silence all of your devices. For our virtual guests joining us, please take a moment to mute your audio. And before I kick off formally introducing our next speaker, I'd like to thank our esteemed panel guests, our panel moderator, for sharing their expertise with us and their time today. Lastly, I'd like to thank members of the BU community who made today's event such a great success. In particular and among them are our events and conferences team, our lesson production team members, marketing and communications, our dining services partners, and community safety and preparedness team members. Of course, I have to thank our key members from the Office of Human Resources and the Office of the Senior Diversity Officer, the teams there. Now let's turn it to Dr. Fred Folks, who will be our next speaker. Professor Folks is the founder and director of the Human Resources Policy Institute here at BU. The HRPI, as it's colloquially known, is a partnership between Questrom Business School faculty and over 50 chief HR officers of many of the largest companies in the US. Prior to joining the faculty at BU, Dr. Folks taught at Harvard Business School. His research and teaching interests include employee and labor relations, benefits and executive compensation, and the strategic role of HR in creating and sustaining competitive advantages for firms. Dr. Folks works with companies to develop and teach ed executive education programs for HR professionals. And his principal publications include Creating More Meaningful Work, Personnel Policies in Large Non-Union uh, Companies, Executive Compensation, a strategic guide for the 1990s. And Professor Folks has also written numerous articles, including five published in the Harvard Business Review, two in directors and boards, and he's developed over 160 case studies for HR professionals. Dr. Folks was named a fellow of the National Academy of Human Resources, which is the human resources profession's highest honor for outstanding achievement. He received his MBA and DBA degrees from Harvard Business School and an AB magna cum laude Phi Beta Kappa from Princeton University. Dr. Folks is a director of Operation ABLE, the NAHR Foundation, and the New England HR Association. Lastly, he is a former director of Bright Horizons, Cambridge Medical, Panera Bread, and Wheelock College. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Folks. Good morning. You're supposed to say, I say good morning, you're supposed to say it's a good morning. That's the way this thing says it works. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here. It's such an important topic. It's such a, uh, a, a crucial time. And I'm privileged uh, to have the honor of introducing both our moderator and our, our keynote speaker. Uh, first, our moderator, uh, my Boston University colleague, Asia Batassos. He was born in Egypt. He's been at Boston University for over 30 years. He is the William Fairfield Distinguished Professor of Computer Science. 
the highest distinction bestowed upon senior faculty at Boston University. There isn't a single one at our, at our, our School of Management. And he does it all, uh, teaching, research, service. He's won numerous uh, teaching awards. His publications and research interests include cloud computing, distributed systems, real-time systems, security, and privacy. A consultant and expert witness, his research has received literally tens of millions of dollars from both government and industry and resulted in over 20 theses, uh, patents, startups, and hundreds of uh, refereed papers. I'm so glad you're able to be with us today. And I have a special honor of introducing our keynote speaker, uh, Johnny Taylor, the CEO of SHRM. If you don't know SHRM, S-H-R-M, it's the Society for Human Resources Management, the largest professional HR organization in the world, has over three, almost 350,000 uh, members, and it is the voice of the, of the profession and they do such good work in training and education, influencing uh, public policy. Um, they are in 165 uh, countries. Um, he, Johnny, uh, is uniquely qualified uh, for his, uh, his role. He, is a, uh, uh, he was an undergraduate in business at the University of Miami, earned a master's and law degree uh, from Drake University, and he is, I said, uh, uniquely qualified for his, his position. Uh, he's practiced employment law. Uh, he's been head of HR for more than uh, one company. He's a board member of public and private companies, as well as uh, nonprofits. And he was the former CEO of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. Giving back to education, he is the vice chair of the board at the University of Miami and a former member of the board of uh, counselors at Drake University. He's won numerous awards, including the Association for Management, what I'm involved in, uh, the Women's Business Collaborative, and CE Update. He's also the uh, uh, author of the bestseller book called uh, uh, Reset. I can share you with, uh, 20 years ago, we were former directors of, uh, of, uh, of HRM. Um, so I've known him for a long time, and what I can tell you all is at the time, Sherm apparently had a policy that they wanted two teenagers on the board. So that's how we uh, served together, right? Johnny, welcome to, welcome to our campus. <laughs> That is fabulous, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Folks. That is hilarious. This is now my friend forever. He will um, do the talk intro. I'm gonna take him on the road with us, right, Antonio? I mean, I love that. Listen, it is such an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure uh, to be given the opportunity to spend 20 minutes. And see, I'm a Southerner, I could go on, tw my introduction could be 20 minutes. So uh, we're gonna jump right into the material. But before I do, I wanna recognize actually three people very quickly, Amanda Bailey, who I know is in the room, the head of HR here. Please, let's shout her out. When Amanda called and asked me if I could participate, there are two people who sort of really pushed me. She was one of them and Fred Folks, Dr. Folks, uh, because I leave here literally about 30 minutes after I finish, I'm on a plane to Nassau, Bahamas. Don't worry, not vacationing, because I'm there less than 24 hours and I'm flying back and then we're going to Savannah and then ultimately to Dubai and Japan. So I'm gone for the next 10 or 12 days and so only Amanda could convince me to do this today. But I am um, I'm very honored to be here and, and hope that what I say over the next oh, 19 and a half minutes or so will be relevant uh, and helpful as you think about not just chat GPT, but the entirety of all of the AI and generative AI and how it's going to impact the workforce and the workplace of the future. We, I, I want to, for just a second, take you back. There are two dates that I think 100 years from now people are going to be thinking about and talking about. And I, and just, if you'd all for, just think about this. Where were you on Friday the 13th? That was the first date. Friday, March 13th, 2020. 
That was the day if you all, I see the nods now, yeah, I get it. Not from the movie, although the movie was mild compared to what we actually experienced, right? That was the day when we all were introduced to COVID. That was the day when our lives changed forever because when you were, thought you'd come to school on Monday, you weren't. We all went remotely, not all, but most of us changed our lives fundamentally. How we worked changed. And if you recall at the time, President of the United States, our leaders, and all said to us, don't worry, go hunker down for 21 days and this will all be good. And then 21 days became 21 months. And during that period of time, life changed fundamentally and will forever mark not just how we experience life in the workplace in the United States, but globally. So that's the first big date. There's yet another date, though, which is the subject of our talk today. And it's interesting when you put these two together, this is going to be sort of a mark of a very significant sea shift in the way we live. The second date, November 30th, 2022. That was when we were all formally introduced to ChatGPT. And unlike other technologies that had been introduced in the past, usually new technologies are introduced to technologists, right? And we in the public, you know, the proletariat, the masses, we don't hear about it for 10, 12 years, if ever, because there's some great technologies that will never see the light of the day for various and sundry reasons. But it was full scale introduced to the world. And all of a sudden, things happened. And let me tell you the two things, when I talk about those two dates, right? Friday the 13th, March 13, 2020, and then 2022, November, 25th, November 30th. What happened on that day, which was really, really interesting, both of those times, is they both fundamentally presented and represented a risk, an existential threat to mankind. First, threat to our lives. That's what COVID represented right? The idea that you could just disappear. Otherwise, doing fine, you get this thing that no one can solve for. There's no treatment for. Heck, we don't even know what it is, how it's how. We don't know anything, but you could die tomorrow. And we saw it happening globally. Here's the new one. Human beings are ex find an existential threat to their livelihoods. So lives were threatened back in 2020, and now livelihoods are being directly impacted by what we are seeing over the last year. And the ChatGPT revolution, and I think that's the right way to describe it, uh, is less than a year old. And it has literally begun to transform lives. There's not a headline in a major news media outlet lately that doesn't point to how many jobs are going to be taken away by ChatGPT. 300 million jobs are gonna disappear, 500 million jobs. If you don't think that is absolutely freaking people out, you're wrong. There's a naivete if you believe everything is going to be fine. And let me tell you what's unique about this introduction of technology. In times past, automation impacted the blue collar workers, the service workers. Chat GPT is coming for your jobs. And therefore, that's really threatening. You think about it. I've spent, I'm a lawyer by training, as you heard. And, and I spent 12 years of K through 12 education, three years, four years in undergrad, three years, 19 years of formal education. And all of a sudden, the major law firms have said, I need 20% fewer of you. So the time you've spent, the debt that you've incurred, the gratification that you've delayed, it doesn't matter because there's a machine that can take out a significant number of jobs for which you've trained. This is why this has become a big issue. I know this is sobering. You're all like, listen, tell me some positive news. But this is the moment that, and here, just in a period of fewer than three years, all of this change has been introduced. So I can, I'm often, you know, questioned, why should people embrace AI if ultimately it may take my livelihood away from me and the quality of my life away from me? Why would I be excited about it? I'm going to tell you why net net in just, to, you know, the next several minutes, why you have to, why it's good for us. And there's some obvious reasons and also highlight what we need to be concerned about. So I want to talk about the construct and the, how we're going to approach this is one VUCA plus business transformation. I'm going to spend some time. I'll tell you what VUCA means for those of you who don't know, but an acronym 1987 used by the U.S. War, uh, War College. Basically, this idea for military leaders that there is significant change coming about and we've got to have a way to respond to it. And there's significant business transformation associated with it. And then we have a true people scarcity problem. 
and I'll share a lot of information with you, but at the end of the day, Americans in particular started having fewer and fewer children in the year 2000. The decline was especially noticeable in the year 2020 because no one wanted to become pregnant and go to a hospital if you could get into a hospital because of COVID. So the American birth rate dropped an astounding 4% in one year, and it was already on a decline. And I just want you to think about this, not to be tongue in cheek about it and cute about it, but if all of you decided to become particularly frisky tonight and you went home and procreated, it won't solve for our problem for another two decades because that kid's born today and has to grow up and go be educated and go to college, hopefully, et cetera. So we have a significant replenishment rate problem in the United States, and it's globally. Japan, for example, where I'm headed as a part of this upcoming trip, fact, right now they sell more adult diapers than baby diapers. That's fact. So there's a lot going on. America is browning and graying at once. So we have some real issues around people scarcity that would suggest to you that between all of the VUCA that we experience, all of the business transformation, the unrest, the volatility, et cetera, plus the people scarcity, we need AI. It's not that we should be afraid of it and not embrace it. You must embrace it because we simply have some problems that a flourishing economy, a thriving economy, cannot survive if we don't have some support. We just have a limited number of people and a ton of change. And as we all know, people generally resist change. So we need to embrace AI. Take you through something first and this whole idea of VUCA. I promised you it will tell you what it stood for. This is actually the concept of the day now. More and more leaders are talking about it. Again, it was introduced back in 1987 in a very interesting time in our history. But this idea that the new norm the new abnormal, as I refer to it, is about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And we in business are constantly using this term to kind of talk about the world that you're gonna grow into. The chart below is just an example, by decade, of oil prices. And it just shows you, back in the day, right, standard deviation oil prices over a decade, 3.6. The next decade, the 90s, took us to 12.6, almost like four times more. And then we're doubling in the most recent decade. Oil prices, it just gives you an idea of how much change is occurring. Our parents were not close, not even slightly thinking about this level of change. But this chart alone tells you the world that we're going to. And how is it directly impacting business? Well, let me tell you, business has to transform quickly in response to it. 90% of the Fortune 500 companies that existed in 1955 are gone, merged, or contracted. That's deep, 90%. These things were supposed to be built to last, remember? And every indication is not so much, and they're going away faster than we've ever seen. But here's the part that really strikes me, is that in the last two decades, Ed, <laughs> we were just talking about this, Dr. Folks, we were on the board together of SHRM in 2000. We were voted in together in the year 2002. But think about this, right now, 52%, more than half of those companies have simply vanished from the Fortune 500. So business is experiencing this VUCA moment in ways that we've never seen. And that's 2000. I would submit to you that we're gonna see the other 50% of them potentially, or at least 46%, some are suggesting, will go away over the next decade and be replaced with something new. This is the world. So that's the idea that business is transforming plus VUCA is occurring and becoming the norm. Let's talk about people scarcity. I'm gonna run through this real quickly. As you know, the latest Department of Labor numbers showed us that 9.6 million open jobs in America. Let me tell you, with a 3.8% unemployment rate, only four or five million people are looking for jobs. That is a problem. Remember I talked about the birth rate problem? It's a problem now and it's only going to get worse over time. Secondly, and all of the data tells us, even in organizations where people are really happy, 40% of your employees are looking at any given time. And those are the people who are actively looking. The other 60% are being poached by other organizations. So there's this new norm that we know is coming about in HR where 25% annual turnover is the norm. For those of us who were in business for a long time, I can tell you back in the day, if you had 25% turnover in your department, you were deemed a very poor people manager. HR was going to knock on your door and we were gonna get rid of you because you were just churning through people. This is the new norm and all of our data back at Sherm is indicating that it may actually go higher because people have increased opportunities. 
And then finally, I've talked about this, the birth rate. Significant birth rate decline, and we have got to do something about it. All of that has led to a AI plus HRI trying to work together, and we are now incorporating AI significantly into the HR practice. There are a couple of these things that jump away right away. Recruiting. There's just no way when you're trying to scan the world, survey the world to find the best talent. Remember, it used to be that you had to find people, but now people are working remotely, so your talent could be in India. It can be in China. It can be wherever. We've got to find those people. You can't hire enough TA people to do this work and talent acquisition for you to use an acronym that we do in HR, you can't find enough, you can't hire enough, you couldn't afford it. So we are increasingly using AI to make us more efficient and more fair. And so as much as we're threatened, and I'm gonna talk a little bit in closing about the bias of HR, of AI, there's a real fear that we don't appreciate how biased human beings are. Oftentimes they don't even know it. It just happens. People talk about unconscious bias. The one thing about a machine, is the person sitting across it for an interview doesn't see a pregnant woman. They don't see a black man. They don't allow all of their experiences to come in. The machine is just making some decisions. As imperfect as those decisions are, let me tell you, they're better than what we currently do as human beings. Human beings think we make great decisions around people. The best HR functions only get it right about 50% of the time, the best and you're more likely to fail in your decision-making around people's talent, as well as their alignment with your culture in significant ways. These are some of the ways that we're thinking about it. In terms of making us more efficient in HR so that we can free up HR people, we're now going to use chatbots and other opportunities, chat GPT, GPT, generative AI, uh, tools to help us become far more efficient so we can spend ourselves, spend our time on more value-added work i.e. like making sure that your mental health and your physical health are in touch. We focused historically so much on physical health, not enough on mental health. So just to let you know, I could go on and on. This is usually a 45 minute talk, but these are the ways that we know that we are positively embracing AI in HR. Okay, and then finally, as I talk about what we should watch out for, because you never can end these, there are threats to everything. There's opportunities, there's pluses and minuses, but a couple of things, the ethical and legal considerations are real. The idea that, idea that we're surveilling people, we're surveilling them when they don't even know they're being surveilled. We're collecting big data, and the question is, is it appropriately an anonymized? Now, I'm not the research you're gonna hear from my fellow panelists, they know all this stuff much better than I, like I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express right now, so I'm an AI specialist <laughs> last night, that's what I know about it. But I can tell you that we're very, very significantly concerned about the privacy issues, bias, and some of the bias is in the machine learning human bias because LLMs do that, large language models, and they begin to understand and learn our behaviors. So our behaviors include bias. So we're thinking about that. We're also concerned about the new digital divide. Why is it that the data would tell you from Pew Institute that Asians are the number one users of ChatGPT, followed by white men and blacks and Hispanics trail? And that's not for any particular reason. There are no laws that prevent these groups not to use it and to adopt it, but they're not doing it. And over time, that will result in some significant bias, and we're worried about that being the new digital divide. And then people replacement. As I said, if you read a headline that says 300 million jobs are going away, immediately you're like, I'm not so interested in embracing that technology because I may be one of them. My mother may be one of them. My sister, my brother, my friend, someone I care for. So we're very concerned about the ethical and legal considerations. And ethical being replacing someone's job without preparing them to do something else. Is that ethical? Not legal, but is that ethical for a society to intentionally make people unemployable? And then workforce implications, reskilling and upskilling. If you were doing this and ChatGPT takes your job, then what do you do next? We have an obligation, we think, from a human resources perspective to give people opportunities to prepare. If you've not seen the movie Hidden Figures, classic example, they referred to those women as computers. And then when the machine computer came in, they had to retrain and reskill and upskill them to do something different. We're at that same point right now. Finally, the HR practice implications. As I mentioned, there are lots of things in practice that we're thinking about doing very differently than we did before. It incorporates the ethical and legal considerations, but most importantly, the H 
in human resources, human beings. And there's some things that uniquely only humans can do. We've got to figure out how to make sure that AI plus HI equals the new ROI. So with that, I'd like to ask my colleagues to join us, and we can spend some time learning from the experts. Thank you all for this opportunity today. My fellow panelists, Thank you, Johnny, for an amazing, inspiring, and thought-provoking um, talk. You, has, you, you set it up perfectly for this panel. And, uh, but before we start, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, I'll start with Wendy Colby, uh, sitting all the way there on your right. Um, Wendy is the Vice President and Associate Provost of BU Virtual. This is a new unit designed to advance BU's online presence, uh, bringing innovation and service capabilities to support high quality online programs. Wendy has more than five, 25 years of experience in online and ad tech innovation, and she has served in a variety of roles across the higher education landscape. Prior to joining BU, she served as CEO of UMGC Ventures, which is the University of Maryland's global campus um, and the Broad University System of Maryland. In addition, she was a divisional VP at Laureate Education, where she led online innovation and digital transformation for over 80 universities. She has also held senior executive roles with Carnegie Innovations, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, Thomson Reuters, and a Silicon Valley-based startup, Digital Think. I know Wendy, I work with Wendy, she has a passion for education and a mission to increase access and impact for learners everywhere. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Krista Sand Kerbach. Krista is marketing leader for Open Pages, which is IBM's platform for governance, risk, and compliance. And she's also working on the upcoming major launch of Watson X Governance, which is an AI governance toolkit aimed at mitigating risks associated with AI and protecting customers' privacy. Krista is a strategic advisor and marketing leader who has spent her career building and scaling marketing and transformation programs and researching emerging technologies. Krista is an alumna of Dartmouth College and Columbia Business School, a former Fulbright Scholar to Germany, and a Council Officer for the Women in America Professional Development and Mentoring Organization. It's wonderful to have you on. <laughs> All right, we are ready. Um, and with the amazing um, setup that uh, Johnny uh, laid in front of us, um, I'm gonna start with uh, warm-up questions to my fellow panelists. Um, so I'll start with Wendy. Um, everyone who used ChatGPT has a good story to tell about it. Um, can you share an example of something that surprised you or uh, delighted you in your use of ChatGPT? Yes, would be delighted to, and good morning, everyone. Great to see so many out this morning. So. Um, you know, I, as I say to some of my colleagues in BU Virtual today, I'm often using ChatGPT just as inspiration when I want to think about developing a new program. So in about 10 seconds, I came out with a new program on climate action. Um, so we'll see where that goes. But a couple of fun things I did in anticipation of this talk today. I asked ChatGPT, what is one word of advice from the future? Adapt. What is one word of advice from the past? Resilience. What is one word of advice for the present? Balance. 
I thought those were very interesting and inspirational. And then a real quick thing that I did as well is, um, you know, as someone who appreciates authentic writing, good writing, daughter of a poet, as I often tell some of my colleagues, I also asked ChatGPT to write me a sonnet for the ages. I won't read the whole thing, but here's a quick, quick little snippet from that. Now let this sonnet be a song of now, a call to seize the present's fleeting grace. Embrace the world with love and heart, allow the beauty of each moment's warm embrace. For in this fleeting life, we find our stage to write a sonnet for the ages, engage. So isn't that the topic of today's discussion? And if I were an English teacher or a creative writing teacher, my way of responding to this might be to say, ask, here's the prompt to ask GPT to write a sonnet. Now write a reflection or a critique on that. And now write one of your own sonnets. So part of what I think we want to talk about is embracing AI and how to apply it in meaningful ways to inspire curiosity and to really help us move forward. So that's what inspired me recently. That's well, thank you, Andy. That's really amazing. Uh, we, we, we have students joining us some here, some online. So I'm going to turn it to Krista and ask, IBM is working on great things related to AI. Maybe can you share a, a project that is really exciting coming out of IBM? I'd be happy to. And per some of the stats that you shared, IBM has been uh, around since 1911 and early pioneers in AI, and particularly AI for business. But a few applications that I'm really excited about are IBM's partnership with NASA, and I'm a geography major, so this one gets me very excited because we have a partnership um, to uh, open source geospatial models for monitoring natural disasters, crop yields, and all sorts of other environmental um, applications. Uh, another project that we've been working on for a while is our partnership with the US Open, where we use generative AI to, for everything from developing uh, commentary as tennis matches are taking place. We have all sorts of analytics that we can provide our audience to, again, engage our fans in that whole fan experience. And we also bring in governance to make sure that um, we mitigate against the no use of profanity um, and that um, personal data stays safe. And then finally, Generative AI models are actually very energy intensive. While AI can be can have so many sustainability benefits, and there's a lot of AI powered tools that can that can really help achieve sustainability goals. Um, I've recently heard a stat that generative AI models can consume five to fifty times more energy. And I'm happy to say that IBM is working on a number of different solutions to to, to target this, including a brain like chip to make AI more energy efficient so that it's preserving water and preserving resources. Wonderful. So these are current projects. Um, I'm going to turn it to Johnny and ask a question. You, you, you showed us a number of really exciting areas where uh, generative AI can help with HR. Um, how about the future? How about things that are coming down the pike? Maybe you can share with us some, some examples. Well, so it was interesting. That sonnet was beautiful. and. Uh, what we're the the real future now, and I alluded to it in my final comments, were about reskilling and upskilling. A couple of things are happening, and I, I allude, you know, we're browning and graying at once. You may, may not know this, but the fastest growing demographic in the U.S. workforce, people 75 and older. That is the fastest growing demographic in the U.S. workforce. Half of the jobs that will be filled between now and 2030 are going to be filled by people 55 and older. Now, that may sound exciting, and believe me, young people, the closer you get to 50, 55 looks young. <laughs> but uh, that presents another challenge. They're not digital natives. They've not exposed to this. I mean, it's not just ChatGPT. They're actually afraid of it in many instances. So how are we going to take this significant portion of our population and use AI to upskill and reskill them? That's what I'm most excited about, is we've got to figure out how do we bring this to the 60-year-old. And I know you may think that's old, but we need those people. Remember I told you you all weren't having babies? Well, that means somebody's got to do this work, which means this isn't just about the law hiring people because you're not supposed to discriminate and ageism is morally wrong. We actually need 
human beings to work for longer periods of time. They're willing to do it, but won't do so if they don't have the skills to do it in a 21st century way using the new tools called AI. So we're going to use AI to solve for the reskilling and upskilling problem. Thank you. That's amazing. Um, OK, so we heard that uh, AI may take our jobs. It's learning from the massive amounts of information we have. It's actually, arguably, learning to think. Uh, so there is a question of whether or not AI is creative, or is just getting that from, uh, from its data. Um, well, I mean, we can, we, can, we can spend another hour talking about this point, um, and, and you know, technologists have their ideas. Um, but let me just say that there is an element of creativity, if not just AI, but in cooperation with people. So I'm going to start a line of questions along this. I'm going to start with Krista, given all the work that IBM is doing in that space. Maybe if you can share with us your views on this AI and creativity, and maybe elaborate about what is most exciting about AI in that space. I believe that creativity is the must-have AI skill. And I think it's pretty exciting that we're even talking about AI in this way. It's very easy for AI to come up with something that's novel and unexpected. But when you think about it, how likely is AI actually to come up with something that's novel, unexpected, and useful? Therein lies the importance of humans working with AI in order to bring those two together. I think that AI has so many applications for creativity. For instance, in my world as a marketer, we can use AI to help more rapidly um, generate new ideas, accelerate our prototypes, and it can really work so very well as a smart and efficient assistant. But it's exciting because we're not at the point where AI can do everything end-to-end -end creativity. I think we're a long way from, from ever getting there, and we, and we shouldn't aspire to that. It's so important to keep humans at the center of this, and because we have that AI to help accelerate so much of that work, again, we can do more rapid experimentation, and we can use, um, we can use those parts of our, our brains and engage with it um, and you know, be strategic thinkers. And I think that that's really exciting. Uh, wonderful, which actually lays uh, the stage for yet another question. Um, believe it or not, my phone decided to, to ring. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I actually am a believer that the future is where a member of your team is going to be AI and you have to work with it as a co-pilot, as a co-member of the team. So I'm gonna now turn it to Wendy to talk about how we can educate students so that they work with AI as mm. their partner in a way. Yeah, thanks, Azar. I, I love thinking about co-pilot, you know, co-creator, co-teacher in AI, and you know, we're already seeing some really amazing examples of this. So today we have Lily, right, the new McKinsey AI agent, who is now, you know, going through a hundred thousand research documents and transcripts to come up with data models and recommendations, and even pair you with the best consultant who's going to suit your needs. We have Cody, which is Google's new co-pilot. Actually, using that term, co-pilot, your AI pair for programming. So really changing the game in the way we think about programming. We have Lingo Pale, which translates videos in over 60 languages today. And one of my favorites, many of you may have seen it, is Camigo that's coming out of Khan Academy. Happened to have the opportunity to hear a speech from Saul Khan a couple of months ago. And one of the things that you can now do with this virtual tutor is you can have dialogue with a character in a novel. So imagine now I can ask questions of Daisy in The Great Gatsby. And so it's completely changing the way we think about how to apply this in education and tapping into something you know Johnny was talking about earlier, because change is hard. And I equate this a little bit, bear with me for a minute, but I remember if any of you have been to the exhibits, you know, Van Gogh exhibit, immersion experience, I went to one of these in Chicago a couple years ago. I was a skeptic. I like going to museums. I like seeing the actual artwork. I like looking at the brushstroke, right? But if you go to one of these immersions, it's a pretty 
extraordinary experience with all these pixelated. And what struck me was actually leaving that exhibit. There was a young man who was telling his friend he had never heard of Van Gogh before. And I said, how is this possible? And then, he, so here this exhibit opened, opened access, opened his eyes in new ways, and he was carrying a book that he got in the bookstore about Van Gogh, and maybe a mug too, because you know, it's commercial. But this is, I think, our opportunity, again, back to what Johnny and, and Krista were saying, engage, apply, experiment, innovate, and really think of AI as a partner, and how to apply it responsibly. May I jump in there? One thing, though, that, that and I don't mean the though in a negative way, but what we're f concerned about in the workforce, and I can tell you just a quick story of a, one of our colleagues who explained that her 10-year-old was asked to, 10-year-old, Okay, fifth grade was asked to submit a paper describing his uh, how excited he was about the uh, fall, the season that we're in, and so he went into ChatGPT, unbeknownst to her, mm -hmm. to prepare it, and he put in pumpkin spice and a couple of things. Long story short, it presented this wonderful 30, 40 word essay for and submitted it to his classroom teacher and she thought it was just amazing and she of course then immediately called his mother and said you have a cheat on your hand right, right, <laughs> like, right, right, right. Your kid is and i bring that up to say the teacher then one she this my colleague shared the story recounted the story and she said what the teacher really focused on was uh, is this has this kid learned shortcuts Will he or she, not cheating, because you have to, of course, be thoughtful about it intentional. You know, it's hard to say you cheated unintentionally. But anyway, he, uh, the concern was that the skills that you need to develop, the critical thinking skills at that point, if you bypass them, will you be able to solve the kinds of problems, complex problems, that human beings are gonna experience over the next couple of decades? And they're concerned about not making you focus for an hour and put together the perfect paragraph. Will you, it, but is ChatGPT ultimately right. gonna hurt us in that regard? Yeah, and just a, just a quick follow up on that, right? I think that we could have a long debate yes. on this and spend another hour on it, but that same story, I think it was on 60 Minutes or something, you know, where the mother was revealing her son and a very young child and had created this amazing graphic novel. And so the teacher, you're right, had called and asked about this. But what was interesting from the mother's point of view is her child hated to write. He had no interest in really even exploring writing as a medium. And so this is, I think, the dialogue we need to have, right, to open up, not just to assume it was cheating, right, but to open up that dialogue and say, ah, but we've really prompted curiosity and critical thinking and new ways of exploring writing. That's right. So actually, this is great, and we can spend 10 hours on it, just one hour. As, as a faculty, I'll tell you what I tell my faculty. We have to up our game. It's really about pedagogy. Yes. So, so absolutely, you don't want to bypass critical thinking. But that's on us to change the way we teach so that asking GPT for the answer is not what you learn. I'll give you one example. We have a faculty in the, uh, member in our Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences who developed a client in front of ChatGPT to answer his students' questions about his homework assignments using the Socratic method. It's unbelievable what the students do, mm. and they say we learn a lot that way. The point is, well, maybe just doing the homework the way we're doing it is wrong. There's a different way. So I totally believe that this is really the way to go. Thank you for bringing the point about critical thinking, Johnny. Um, so let me, we've been working a lot on the, the, the workforce of the future. These are our students, um, which is a new generation of worker that knows how to work with AI. So while they're intrigued, they work with it, we can certainly think about um, the existing workforce. So, so the, the future, great, they have time. You talked about transformations, Johnny, and I want to sort of focus a little bit on, on that point. So I'll start with Krista. Um, as a technology company that is in the business of developing AI solutions, how much do we earn and build the trust in AI so can we, we can all embrace it? And let me even narrow it a little bit. What should AI solution providers do? Building trust in AI is not a technical solution, and it's definitely not just about a tool. 
I really believe that you need a holistic approach that includes people and governance. And just to explain AI governance for a moment, it's the process of directing, managing, and monitoring the AI activities of an organization to help organizations minimize risk and, um, and meet government regulations, which is really important because, as you may know, the EU AI Act um, and others are, have very hefty uh, fines and penalties for large and small organizations. We all have a responsibility to think critically about and challenge our models. So as employees, as working with, um, working with AI models, again, this is that, that need for that uh, critical thinking. Um, and then as organizations, there's also some things that we can do. At IBM, for instance, we have an ethics board. We have a center of excellence for trustworthy AI, and importantly, it includes people of different backgrounds. And I think that that piece is critical. So first of all, employees are six times more likely to innovate in diverse environments. And think about that in terms of the development of AI and what you can do with those diverse communities. But also, as you were talking about with, with eliminating bias and increasing trust, again, we need those different perspectives. We know that, uh, the builders of AI have been too homogeneous to date, and that needs to change. And so a big part of building trust in AI is bringing those diverse voices uh, together um, to make it better for everyone. Thank you. Um, so I think Johnny hinted to what could go wrong, let's put it this way. Um, <laughs> And everything he hinted to can happen in any type of field. Uh, even, we talked about students, they can cheat. So I'd like to focus on HR. Maybe if you can share with us how AI can go wrong with HR and what should the employers do if they're gonna start using these tools. Right, uh, the governance. So when we typically think of governance rules, we think about it in the context of the law and what govern governments uh, will do to put guardrails in place to ensure that people aren't being illegally or inappropriately and unethically surveilled. Well, we have to do the same thing in HR. The governance rules, how do we use this in a responsible net net good way? Because anything can be used for bad. And so what we're spending a lot of time, and you're seeing organizations do a lot of this right now, is to figure out we don't want to limit creativity because you've put in place too many rules, especially with new technology. You essentially choke the technology out and human beings have a, have a, a sort of uh, intentionally, they are, they are right now trying to limit. I was with, on Congress just recently sitting, walking around Capitol Hill where we're headquartered and I gotta tell you, the number of unions and employee groups, including civil rights groups who are going in saying AI is bad for us and therefore shut it down. And the reality is, as we've seen on the mess that is Capitol Hill right now, um, as great as machines are, they don't vote. And so if you get enough phone calls coming into your office from your constituency that says AI is bad for me, they will legislate it away or at least push it back to just the technologists and we as the average human beings won't be able to take advantage of it. So what we're trying to do from the HR perspective, the answer is we're literally talking about how do we keep this thing from un unfairly and disproportionately impacting human beings because legislators will not allow that to happen because human beings vote. Okay. And secondly, how do we do this in such a way where we don't disproportionately impact certain groups of people? I love your point about diversity because it's critical. I alluded to the whole notion of the digital divide, but we are seeing it in spades now uh, in, in, with the adoption, the embracing of, of um, ChatGPT in particular and all of the generative AI tools because there are several of them, BARD, et cetera. But we are seeing a disproportionate use and embracing by certain populations and others aren't. And that's, so it's bigger than just who developed it. It's actually who's utilizing it. So if a group, and so think about, go fast forward, the job descriptions of the future say require competency in AI. Well, if black people aren't adopting it and using it and women are disproportionately using it, less than fewer than men, 
we could have a problem where unintentionally we exclude a significant portion of our population. Our intent is not to do that, but once you say this is a requirement of the job and we know that society has not allowed those populations or not, not allowed, has not encouraged those populations, diverse populations to do it, then guess what? You legitimately will be excluding people and that and we can't afford to do it. That's the biggest HR issue. It's a funny thing, back in the day, and I'm gonna be remembering brief on this. In HR, our process, Amanda knows, was to exclude people. We wanted, we wanted a thousand applications and we wanted one person. Just like in higher ed, you like to brag about your selectivity. That, that is an exclusionary <laughs> process, not an inclusionary process. Well, we don't have that luxury anymore and we're really concerned about how we could end up excluding significant swaths of the U.S. population in particular. Thank you, Johnny. Um, Johnny mentioned the importance of upskilling and reskilling of the current workforce. And um, being at a university, what's our job in that? They cannot just quit their jobs and come apply for an undergraduate degree in, in, in data sciences. So uh, turning it to Andy, uh, given the setup of BU Virtual, I'll ask you if you can elaborate a little bit about where you see the growth in specific student population or learners and how AI can be used to move the needle uh, when it comes to professional development, perhaps even addressing yeah. some of the questions that Johnny raised. Yeah, you know, first uh, I think it's all about educate, 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 right? Teach it, don't ban it. I, I think this is, you know, as I think about this from a university standpoint, and I appreciate what you said about, yes, BU is a selective institution, but we're also about opening access and opening, this is particularly a BU virtual mission, opening access to new segments of learners around the world. So I think you're right, we really have to think about that. You know, I think it really requires bringing uh, conversations like this together. And in particular, what I love about this conversation is we're bringing industry, we're bringing, you know, IBM, we're bringing Sherm, we're bringing university leaders together. We're bringing many of you, students and faculty in this room and leaders. We need to open up those dialogues. We need to look at our broader ecosystem because beyond even programmatically, uh, you know, with Auser, we're trying to look at uh, new AI and data science programs of the future so we can actually teach the workforce. Well, we need need to be working with folks like IBM and Sherm to, to input into these programs so the return on investment you as students, and I think there are some of you in the room, that means you're going to have a relevant job of the future. And so the more we can be bringing these communities together and looking at how we do this, you know, Johnny, you talked about skills this morning too. Uh, this is something we're looking at in a big way across Boston University, which is how do I look at the skills I have today to apply toward what I do today and to apply toward where I want want to go in the future. So imagine now you're going to see a lot more skills matching services for on-demand skills, for badging, for certificates, for degrees, and there's going to be a whole menu of this going forward. And so we've got to play in that game. This is why we need to be agile, and universities are not always agile, but we need to be agile as a university working in partnership with industry to meet these real needs. I mean, as, as you said, right, there are huge job gaps going on today. So we should have less fear about our jobs going away and look at how we embrace, using your word again, how we embrace where the jobs of the future are going and really educate, 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 right? That's the role of the university in terms of how we advance this forward. So that's how I think about our role here in combination with industry and where we need to work with all of you to create the kind of ecosystem that is going to matter for all of us. All voices matter in this conversation. Well, thank you. Um, so, so we heard a lot about... Um, the digital divide and uh, the importance of having diversity, whether in the development of the technology or even in adoption and governance of the technology. So, so we have our work cut out for us. Yes. And I'm going to start asking Krista a question about, you know, share with us perhaps ways industry can get more uh, communities involved in the development of AI. Um, input basically from the, from the people who are gonna be affected, as well as bringing the right uh, developers of this technology to IBM or, or other companies, yes. I'm personally extremely invested in bringing more women into generative AI. And here's a stat and reason why. 
eight out of 10 women's jobs and six out of 10 men's jobs are gonna be impacted. And that's based on a study of particular roles and the gender breakdowns of those. So it's critically important. This is not optional. Some of the ways that we can, that we can approach this. Again, we have to take it beyond the walls of communities like this, of working with our technology peers and, and really get into our communities. One of the ways that IBM is approaching this is through our Skills Built program, where we've announced that we're going to work to train two million people in AI by 2026, and with, we have a particular focus on underserved communities. I also believe, from what we're talking about, that it, that it begins with the schools, that it begins, that we have to get started early, and we have to make this part of a, of a well-balanced education to also teach the critical thinking skills, writing skills. You know, the great thing about generative AI is that this is the first time that you don't need coding skills to be able to use it. You just need to be able to write. So the imperative is there to be a good writer. Um, I'm happy to say too that AI, I really feel that AI can be the great equalizer. You know who the biggest users of telemedicine are? I recently found out it's Native American communities. I also had a lovely conversation with a woman from South Africa a couple of days ago who was sharing about the work that she was doing with orphaned girls in schools, bringing the, the, the beginnings of AI education to them um, and um, in, in small nuggets. We can, we can start early and if they can do it, I think that we can do it. But she's also working now with young professionals who have just gotten computer science degrees, teaching them about AI, and was able to help some of them find jobs, again, in South Africa in less than two weeks. And that's game changing for their families. So there's an imperative, and I think that, there's a, that we can do it. Wonderful, fantastic, wow. Um, so, so we talk about how AI can hurt, and Krista just told us, well, it, it can actually be an equalizer. Um, so a question to Johnny, how do you see AI becoming an equalizer or actually fixing things within HR? Well, in, and I'm gonna say within HR, ultimately HR, this isn't HR for HR's sake. Our task, our whole purpose is to ensure that the organizations, whether they're for-profit, higher ed, government, we are supposed to supply a diverse, qualified, hardworking, culturally aligned workforce. That's what our job is. It's not just for HR, uh, for, for HR. And in doing so, if you think our biggest challenge facing organizations right now is this talent scarcity. Finding the people with the right skills, we've got to ensure that our employees, their children, to your point, really important that the communities can in the future be provide us a supply of diverse, highly qualified, AI exposed students. That's, that's ultimately what we've got to do. And so when I think about the equalizing opportunity for us, it's very much about ensuring that our employees are all skilled up and that those employees go into the various communities. Even if you're helping someone, I'm gonna say this real quickly, even if you're volunteering, we oftentimes go and we volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA or et cetera, and you take kids out to play basketball. Fun is fun and they should do that and that's all great, but you should also, if you have the opportunity to interact with one of those children who are from under-resourced, uh, uh, under-exposed neighborhoods, expose them to AI. So just taking a kid for the weekend and saying, in addition to you know, taking to a basketball game, have you tried ChatGPT? Maybe I'll pay for your membership or subscription to ChatGPT four or five, whatever number it is, what number is that? <laughs> whatever it is, but those are the sorts of gifts that we can give. I've literally said, every one of my family members is going to get that for Christmas. Now my mother's like, give me something more than that. But, <laughs> but the <laughs> idea, don't stop there, my son. But, <laughs> but the notion is, and that's my mother, that's my almost 80 year old mother. Like we have to give, we have an obligation as well-educated you know, folks to make sure that the rest of the population is exposed to this and that access isn't the problem. We have to ensure that access is not the problem. If we do that, it will equalize for itself. If we go out and we talk this thing up and then give it to people, it's free, we know the first version, but the better versions are better, I can tell you it's worth the money, and you spend a little bit more, that's how I think we ultimately are going to equalize, as best you can in this world, equalize opportunity. I 
can't equalize outcome, but I sure as heck can make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to pursue the American dream, which is you know, work and the dignity of work and providing for your families. Wonderful. Um, I'm gonna come back to the equity from a different angle in a second, but um, something that came up a few times in the discussion is you know, the ethical use of, uh, of AI or generative AI or ChatGPT, et cetera, and we heard about students, maybe they, they're just asking you to solve their homework problems. So, so there is a need for governance of this within the university. Yes. And a question that maybe I'll ask to Wendy, if you can share with us uh, what are ways in which the university can actually develop the equivalent of what is the a good conduct uh, whether it's in research or, t or teaching. Yeah, thanks, Ozer. And just to first tap into something Johnny was saying, you know, because often I think in audiences like this, it's good to give some really practical and pragmatic advice, you know, back to educate, educate, educate. Um, there is a resource I came across recently. It's from Auburn University. I know we use it here at BU as well, Teaching with AI. So if there are any faculty in the room, it's about a $30 license. Um, and, you know, they have made this available to a consortium of universities, right, around the nation. And so, again, practical advice. Uh, so, again, when I think about, you know, these are real concerns that we've talked about. I mean, you know, AI has become a sensation. Just go Google and you'll see, you know, I saw something this morning about the, a student who developed a graphic novel in a weekend and put it on social media and boy was there vitriol uh, around Twitter, right? So uh, what we as universities are really trying to do is convene task forces. BU also has a task force that's being led across the university today in almost every function. And we're looking at research and we're talking to faculty and we're bringing in students and we're experimenting. Uh, you know, Harvard here across the river just set up an innovation hub. We're talking to our partners in all universities to see what we can do as well. And then I think, you know, when it comes to, you know, establishing policies around compliance, and again, Johnny talked about this, you don't, I don't think we want to be so rigid given how dynamically this is changing, but how might we inform research? You know, how might we put some investment in research that will help us understand where AI is going and how to responsibly deploy it? And then how do we, it's back to good teaching and learning practices here as well, right? How do we best advise faculty on using AI in the classroom? How do we advise students to use it in ways that is going to enhance their learning and their critical thinking? What are the ethic responsibilities re around data governance and some of these other areas. These are real issues, right? If you put in your own data in your own university or company and you put that, now you could be exposing inadvertently data, personal data about one of your students or one of your employees. We need to be very careful about that. We don't want to do that, right? And so I think uh, what we are trying to do at BU and across a community of institutions is really look at what should the policies be, how do we bring our communities together, how do we collaborate, and how do we take a leadership role, right, as educators, take a real leadership role on what this should look like going forward. If I could just add to the, you cannot underscore, you nailed it, the ethics of this all. So just recently, there's a case that's pretty public of a lawyer who representing someone and they literally used ChatGPT to draft the brief, submitted it to the court. And unfortunately, you've heard the term hallucinations. <laughs> <laughs> there's literally in the AI context, some of the the cases that were cited were either outdated, they were not consistent with the law, et cetera. And that lawyer is facing disbarment right now, as he or she should, as a well, lawyer, I didn't like that. But the idea is we take for granted that people understand the significance and the import of the ethical considerations, just in practice. And another one that is, cons that is bubbling up right now, we're aware of because of a piece of litigation, is a physician, uh, a young person finished their physician PA program, physician assistant program, and used ChatGPT or the equivalent of that. I don't know what product is specific, what tool they used, but to get through their exams, and now you have a person who really doesn't know what they're doing, and they're practicing and treating patients. That's a problem, you know, cute for you to get your, to graduate with your degree, but if you have not actually mastered the body of work, you can go in and do a lot of harm to your fellow citizens. In a context of a criminal court, someone could go to, if you don't know what you're doing, malpractice creates real problems for people. And in the context of physicians or physicians, assistants, nurses, et cetera, 
failure to learn and to treat this thing and use it ethically could have serious implications for our fellow human beings. And you know, I will just add too, you know, obligation for universities, right, around let's make sure we're assessing our students properly, right, and really thinking through that, right? We've got to own that, right, as opposed to just letting a student say this one final paper, if something was inappropriate, is it. So again, the onus is on us as educators as well to think through how we best apply that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to stay a little bit more on the ethics. It's very important. Um, we talked about what, what, how do we involve those affected in coming up even with these policies, right? So in, in, in computer science, we have this idea of participatory computing, which is the people gonna be impacted by it should be part of designing the interface if you want. So I'll give you an example. So BU, we had to come up quickly. November 20th, was it 30th? Right, yeah, November 30th. Um, <laughs> when ChatGPT came up with, well, January, starting a new semester, already last semester there were you know, students who used it and they were exposed. So we had to come up with policies, like do we allow it or not? In CDS, we did that. You know how we did it? We did it in a class on the ethics of data science. Yes. And it was the students, along with the, with the professor, who is a professor of theology and, and ethics, mm -hmm. developed mm -hmm. the policy together. Mm -hmm. They debated it. They came up with it. We were the first university to even start thinking about putting this out. And then they proposed it to the faculty. But who developed it? It was the students yeah. as part of learning the, what, how things can happen. So I just want to mention this. And now I'm going to pivot a little bit to another thing we didn't talk about. We talked about industry. We talked about how AI consumes a lot of energy. Well, guess who can leverage it, even in industry? It's the big companies. It's the ones who can afford to come up with their own language model. By the way, ChatGPT is a demonstration for you, but companies are not going to use ChatGPT. They're going to use their own data and data that they can get that nobody else has to train their own LLMs, which are called large language models. I mean, I give you examples of people using it for chemistry research, right? So it's, it's not just about, you know, the fun things we do with ChatGPT. But here is the question. Who has the resources to develop these LLMs? If you develop them, you have an advantage. We think about small business. We think about minority-owned businesses. How can they compete in a world where the big people basically have access to this technology? I'd like to, I don't have a specific per person to answer this, but I'd love to this hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, IBM, you should. Yeah, IBM. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'd be happy to. The great thing is that so many of this information is now open sourced. IBM just made an announcement about our Granite models, which are, are available, these large language models, um, and we have free trials and, um, and, and tools that anybody can go and use. And again, we're working to invest in these, uh, in these underserved communities. So I think that, that we and um, many other providers are, are offering uh, the opportunity to get immersed, get your, get your hands dirty. I think it's also not, uh, it, it's a quality over a quantity issue. It's not that you necessarily have to have the biggest data set in the entire world, but the, the beauty of AI where it is, uh, today is that if you have something that's customized for your business, um, you can have a lot more, um, you know, effective results coming out of it. So, would it does it? And I, I don't know the answer to this, so I'm going to ask: Is there a real risk given L LLMs work because by definition they're large, right? When you get too small in an organization, could you actually do harm? from a privacy standpoint, because now you can take the information and very quickly, like we in HR know if there are three people in a department and you release salary information, very quickly we can figure out, you can extrapolate who's making what. And so if you don't have a large enough base, a small company trying to do, use, create, or, or follow the LLM model, is there not real, are there not real risks associated with that? I don't know how it works, so I'm just. <laughs> I'm happy to say that with, uh, from the perspective of IBM solutions, we, that's why we have governance as well, and that's why we, we provide that to anybody who's using our data sets. So 
whatever vendor you work with, it's just really important to vet them and understand what you're getting and that your data is going to be safe. Because yes, cybersecurity risks are real. All of these other risks around using personal data, the fines can really be massive and it's small organizations that can be impacted too. So know who you're working with. And again, if you do work with an external vendor, understand that path. They should be able to guide you through a path from pilot to production and give you that entire framework of, of uh, and, and, and build in that governance. Who's going to get that access? What are you looking to accomplish? And be able to frame that up for you. And if they can't, consider somebody else. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to think about from a university perspective as well. You know, we have a huge amount of data here at Boston University, 17 schools and colleges, right? I mean, we're constantly looking at things like enrollment trends and student success trends and demographic trends. And I can imagine if we had as our own LLM, right? It's back to Johnny's point, you know, we're going to really need to make sure, uh, and if our CIO is in the room, uh, I think she'd be uh, raising her hand here, right, to make sure that we're a really being very careful about data privacy um, in that context, right? And making sure, as you said, you know, the salary information uh, isn't getting out to everyone, but that is hugely useful to us. So we can start to do more predictive, more data-driven, analytical, right? Using these AI tools to really create that, that speed, that efficiency, that smart. Uh, we need to attract the right students, to retain those students, and to educate them in the right ways. Thank you. Um, so. One thing about technology in general is, that is it's not like you buy software and you use it. Right. Companies like IBM, like Google, like Amazon, actually they develop a platform. Yes. But one thing to remember is that it will not be one size fits all. As a matter of fact, it's going to be one size fits one, <laughs> right, in, in a way. <laughs> and, and I think that the question now is, are these solutions going to be accessible, affordable? Because the solution is there, and they will take care of the privacy. I do trust that they can do that, and they can advise us the right way. But are they going to be available? Um, so so to, in the public interest, I'm going to use that word uh, in a second. One of the focus areas for CDS is data science in the public interest. Why, why, why we distinguish it from data science just generally? Because there is a data science for profit, and we should acknowledge that. But there's data science in the public interest, and the question is who's pushing the envelope on that? That's, that's one of the issues. And I think thinking about these platforms, thinking about platform, you mentioned open source, data that's available, we should encourage that. But, and and um, that, that's something that I think could, could be quite useful here. Any comment on, on that from any of the? Yeah, just one quick, and I, again, I've been, the biggest, the thing that keeps me up most at night is that ChatGPT, Pew Institute has some interesting research. Luckily, you can actually do longitudinal research because you know what day it started, and it wasn't that long ago. So we can actually follow the trends. And it is shocking to me that ChatGPT was available, access, free from day one. But everyone's not taking it up at the same rate. So we're seeing specific communities, again, not take advantage of it. So it's not that, that dollars and cents were the, were the barrier, right? I gave it to you for free, yet being offered for free, omnipresent on every news, you know, it's everywhere, and for some reason groups, certain groups are not participating. They're not using it. So you don't even get to the argument of back in the day when we talked to digital divide, well, poor children don't have Wi-Fi, poor children can't afford the computer, like that's not the issue of the day. If you have this thing in your hand called a PDA, a phone, what have you, and you can get this free, why is it that we are not seeing communities use it? That's, I think, the biggest issue of the day for us when it comes to just individual usage. Yeah, and is that an opportunity for things like a, more AI literacy, right, to open up access, to educate? You know, I think there are still a lot of populations, right, that, that don't know how to use it, and we have to demystify it in some ways. And then I, I think, you know, we're just going to see more and more AI embedded in a lot of uh, tools that exist today. I mean, we see this in the world of online learning and digital teaching and learning and academic innovation today. You know, you look at adaptive, AI and adaptive courseware to do your pace of learning. You look at auto grading and now AI tools that are helping professors see where there might have been a miscommunication. So I think it's becoming very all-encompassing in terms of how we're going to look at this going forward. Yep. Part of what I hear about in your question is return on investment. And it's true that historically 
the vast majority of organizations have not seen a return on investment in their use of AI above the cost of capital. It's really, a, it's a very small percentage and we have research on this in our Institute for Business Value. That's changing with generative AI. We, we really are in a paradigm shift where this traditional AI has gone from individual models, it's very task specific training, not generally transferable. So you end up with organizations that have pockets of AI deployed, but again, how are they able to think about that holistically and, and gain that scale? Foundation models and generative AI are changing all of that, where it's requiring fewer resources, you can use the AI for multiple similar tasks, you can train with the domain-specific data, and we're already seeing changes, we're already seeing an increase in the return on investment. So that's one of the biggest things that comes up in my conversations with, with companies, and I wanted to mention that as well. And no matter what, it's still really large, right? The McKinsey report that's out there, and there's a really good report on all of this that you can find if you just Google it, or we can send it out when this, uh, when this video comes out. One and a half billion monthly visits, right, on chat GPT. So it's kind of like what you were talking about with, you know, kind of the employment opportunities out there. You know, it took Facebook five years to get where chat GPT is today. So um, make no mistake, right? This, this is very large and very big, even if we're not yet reaching all the populations. Okay, I, I understand that we only have a few minutes and we certainly want to open it up for lots of questions. I hope you're taking notes. Um, but before I do that, you know, they ask me anything. So, uh, you know, I'll ask my colleagues here if what question I should have asked that I don't ask. They don't have to answer, just the question. We can, we can, um, we can do that during the, the Q&A later. So, Krista. I would say that one of the big, biggest questions that I get is just how do I get started? There's a huge amount of information out there and it's overwhelming. And I know that my job as a marketer is to help curate that path and provide that information in a way that, that makes sense and help people understand beyond just high level thought leadership articles, we need to, get into the depth with the technology, help people really understand the implications and, and, and how to really move with it. Um, kind of as a broader statement, as we know, this is, this is not optional. Um, there's, a, there's a need for, for all of us to get this education now, and the great thing is that there's a lot of resources and ways to do that. Thank you, so how do we get started? That's the first question. Uh, Johnny. Oh, uh, Johnny's looking at me over here, okay. Um, <laughs> So, you know, one of the things I think about as, uh, you know, so I've been in the world, straddled both business and education for a number of years, and, you know, always worn sort of the transformative hat, you know, when you think about even online education, right, there are still a lot of skeptics, maybe some of you in the crowd, so come talk to me after, uh, right, who are, you know, still working on how do we embrace this new modality, right? So what I think, th one of the questions that I think is really important to ask is, do we have the culture that can embrace learning um, and agility? right? Because my experience is when we're not focused on this in our cultures today, then resistance come and fear of change comes. But if we are asking those questions about how do we embrace learning and as part of our own cultural strategic initiatives, and culture has become a big focus here at BU, Amanda and others are leading the charge here on that. I think this has to be a big part of that conversation, agility, openness to exploration, innovation, experimentation, accountability around that. Those are all really important, I think, pillars um, to help us really drive this forward. So asking those questions about culture. I knew I should have spoken before her because <laughs> she took my question, my comment. It's, it is at rest in culture, and that's the biggest challenge for human resources is as a function and as the keepers and nurturers of culture in an organization, how do we take this thing that, as I said, is naturally perceived as a threat and how do you take it and get people to embrace it? And it's fundamentally, how do you build it into the, just the way things occur and operate in a business? That's what culture is about. How do things get done? This chat GPT has thrown this whole thing in the air, like how do you do work? How do you respond to assignments? How do you cite them? I'm, when I was in practice, it was clear. If you took someone else's idea, you put a citation. What do you do when it's all someone else's idea? It's a machine's idea. How do you do this? Source, just, chat GPT. Source, chat GPT. My whole brief. No, but, but, <laughs> but seriously, this is very much about culture and this culture of lifelong learning, this culture, that's, that's really the biggest issue. The technology is there now. How do we build this into our culture such that everyone embraces it? 
All right, so how to get started and how to nurture the culture. Sure. All right, so now this stage where we open it up to your questions. Um, uh, as I said, I hope you have many, and I think there are a couple of microphones. Please make sure you have it so that our uh, online audience can also um, uh, hear your question. So I see a hand. Hi. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming and, and sharing your expertise with us. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Joshua Slattery. I'm a recruitment specialist here uh, at BU. I started using ChatGPT like the month that it came out, really. I used it to help clients and candidates rewrite resumes, create job postings, things like that. We talked a lot about how, from the industry's perspective, it's going to change. I was curious what your thoughts are from a candidate's perspective, a client or a consumer. Do they care that uh, something is going to be created from AI? Uh, my team and I recently watched the LinkedIn Summit a few weeks ago, and they announced that they're going to incorporate AI into LinkedIn Messenger and InMail. Um, do you think candidates are going to notice, or going to care, or going to have uh, any sort of opinion on if these messages are created through, through AI as opposed to you know, someone sitting and typing? Does it matter that it's not you know, genuine, I guess, is, is the word for it. I'm curious what your thoughts are. I think that's Come cool. on. I, yeah, I'm trying to defer to my colleagues because I had the first 20 HR. minutes. But, uh, okay, go for it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm really excited, actually, about the applications for, for AI in HR. There's so many routine tasks that can be automated. It's actually one of the top three use cases for IBM. I mean, think about the the process of, of onboarding a new employee and all of the, the kind of standard, and if you can standardize that, or sending follow-up emails, or there, there's so many different pieces of the process that if you can automate those, then you free up time for the white glove treatment, for really, um, bringing in the, uh, well, also bringing in a, a broader group of candidates, because again, we're talking about needing to um, diversify the number of people who are, who are working in AI, but the ability to make that experience so much better, I think that, you, that it can go from being, um, whether somebody's job hunting, or again, all of those aspects of HR administration for an employee, it can go from being really difficult to delightful. And so, uh, fundamentally, 100% agree, but let me tell you, let me play contrarian for a second. People like to talk to people. And we've learned this, even think about it. When I call my credit card company and I find out that a chat bot's on the other side, I'm not happy about that. <laughs> yes. I get it, you know, it may be more vision for you, MasterCard, but it ain't for me because I want to talk to a human being and I'm talking. And so part of it is we're going to have to educate people to get used to it. But it is amazing when someone calls HR for an HR problem, I'm not so sure I want your AI generated answer. And that's what we're also hearing is, I actually, if you're gonna reject me for a job, freaking pick up the phone and call and tell me. Yeah, don't questions. lose the human, right? <laughs> don't right. lose the human, don't I mean. Don't lose the human, and that's what you're seeing. We are getting feedback which says, be careful now, HR. Don't embrace it so much that there is no human veneer to these interactions, or at a minimum, an escalation opportunity. So I got it. Your chat responded, chat bot responded and told me X, you know, my insurance benefit says Y. We as HR love that because that's one less call I have to take in the middle of the day. I know why we want to do it. Your question I think was how is our client, our consumer, ex what's their experience? Part of it is it's new and they don't know, but when they find out, and I've been on that phone with, I won't name the name of the credit card company, but I'm like, I want to speak to a person. Like, enough of this. And it just takes me into a circle. Your employees are responding when we have maybe adopted and embraced technology at a faster rate than they are embracing it and adopting it. And Does as a hiring sense? manager, too, I think what I would appreciate is if you can do the pre-screening for me, if you can do the content synthesis, if you can, you know, we get hundreds of resumes, right, um, and then bring that human forward, right, once we've done some of those, you know, early uh, screening activities. And so I'm going to play on that one, too. Then what happens if it's screening out people who a human being would have, because there is a nuance to human beings. There are questions I can ask that, you know, I can explain that gap in your resume. The machine sees a gap. 
It doesn't know if you were in jail. It doesn't know if you were pregnant. It doesn't know if you had a mental health crisis. All it sees is this gap, and it may read certain things into that. Whereas if I had an interviewer on the other end of the phone in human resources, a talent acquisition professional, I might have an opportunity to put that in context and not be excluded from consideration. So these are the, and, and I hope no one is taking this as an anti-chat. I just gave the speech on embracing AI, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> just to remind you, I just think these, we have to be very mindful. It's a very good question is potentially are we getting ahead of uh, our, our users and our clients and customers? Wonderful. Uh, I mean, Thank one, you. I'll just add one comment. W the last thing we want is for the applicant to be using ChatGPT and for the employer to also be changing. So now right. GPT the is, is applying and also... <laughs> Convergence. We, we have a name for that in computer science, uh, adversarial networks, but anyway. Uh, Thank you again. Other questions? There's quite a few. Yeah. There's another question here. I think there was a question in the back there too. Hi, so I'm thinking about the students in the room, especially within the HR field, you know, what do you think will be the key skills and knowledge going forward to effectively use this technology? Yeah, go to these folks' classes. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we, we're we practicing HR. These are tools, this this entire AI thing. and and. I tell folks all the time, well, can we come to Sherm to do this? I said, we don't do that. We can tell you how important it is to understand these new tools and to incorporate them into your practice, but it is literally, they're experts who do this at BU, right? Virtual. We, we're at BU Virtual, yes, BU Virtual, a little commercial there. Yeah, you know, um, I cited McKinsey earlier, you know, McKinsey calls this the AI and data economy, and I can tell you what we're thinking about from a programming perspective, working closely with, with Auser's team, right? Uh, you know, our CDS, our computing and data science is an interdisciplinary school here, right? And so we are thinking about AI as applied to all disciplines, right? From HR to supply chain to healthcare to business. And so I think you're going to start to see a lot more programming around that. And again, we would love, you know, part of I think our success is bringing in folks like you, right? Having some student advisories here, again, with our partners in industry to look at how do we align our programming to your needs and the needs of the workforce. So a young man asked me recently, and I got that question, he said, uh, will AI, he's an HR, will AI take my job? And I said, no, someone who understands and utilizes AI in HR will take your job. So a human being's gonna get your job. Yeah. So the best thing that you can do is actually adopt and embrace AI. Your threat is the other human being who does it and you don't. Right. I'm happy to make a quick plug for um, IBM's Watson Orchestrate, which, um, uh, great tool to really um, automate so much of what is happening in AI, and but it works, again, as, a, as an efficient uh, assistant for you, and you, I couldn't have said it better. The HR function is not going away. We need your critical skills, people skills, um, judgment, and, and all of that more than ever. Wonderful. Uh, there's a question in the back there I'd like to... We have a question from online. Yeah. To address the digital divide, will or should employers offer apprenticeships or on-the-job training in AI for new hires? Yes, yes, yes. We're, we almost have to. In you know, the former training and development work that we did, yes, you're going to have to do what we call legal and compliance sort of stuff. Sexual harassment training, harassment free, all of that stuff you've got to do. And even then, you can use AI tools to make it more interesting, more efficient, and asynchronous, and available 24-7, so yes. But we also increasingly are building into the onboarding practice an expectation, this is about a culture of learning, from day one, you're going to be expected to learn new tools, new uh, ways of work, and so this is the new norm now, it really is. There's a question there, yep. I'm Tammy Govea. I'm the director of the Center for Innovation in Social Work and Health. So I really picked up on uh, your comment, Johnny, about the opportunity that AI presents for us to actually have more time, both in organizations, out in communities, to think about, to address, to really embrace um, mental health and well-being and physical health, which you also pointed out. 
So what I'd love to hear from you is, how are you seeing this really play itself out in organizations? Um, because our center has an opportunity to really help shape what that work looks like, get more social workers, more mental health providers within organizations to really focus on employee health and well-being, particularly as we think about you know, even more interactions with uh, technology um, that you know, do have an impact on our health and well-being and just really putting people and humanity at the center of how we're doing our, our work and interacting with AI and other technologies. So I just want to say thank you for bringing that up. And yeah, I want to hear a little bit more detail on how you see that playing itself out. Well, I'm going to cheat here. We don't have a lot of detail because it's so new. The reason I mentioned November 30th is we are all now tinkering with this idea, this new tool. We just, we don't know its abilities, we don't know the downsides, the ethical considerations, et cetera, but we're talking about it, so I want to get your card right after because we have a group of people who study this and will help introduce this to corporations. I will tell you, because of the pandemic, one thing that it shone a bright light on was the mental health crisis in our country. Again, we focus so much on stop smoking, weight loss, et cetera. We were giving away gym passes and all of that and Fitbit machines, and we, we literally did not think about people's mental health. There was no parity between mental health and physical health, even in our benefits. Guys, you know, you can smoke all of your life, get lung cancer, we're gonna treat you until it works out one way or the other, right? Have a mental health crisis, you get five visits to your EAP via phone, the person on the other end of the phone may or may not be high quality. And if you don't figure it out at that point, you pay for it from that point forward. So we have had, we've got a lot of work to do, even before AI, to catch up in terms of parity between the way we treat and see uh, and the stigma associated with mental health versus physical health, okay? But we now know that AI can help us be more effective, more efficient, can act from an access standpoint. So that's what the biggest uh, concern is privacy. When you get into these uniquely personal interactions with human beings, especially on something like mental health, and I'd love my colleague to speak to it, there's some concern about, okay, what's the, what are the risks here? And fortunately, for good or for bad, I'm both a lawyer and an HR person by training, we're risk adverse especially when it comes down to something so uniquely human, is if you get this wrong, uh, short of killing someone, you could destroy their lives otherwise. And so we're real sensitive. So it's early stage, November 30th, 20th. We haven't even gotten a full year of it, but you're spot on. Everyone's talking about it. IBM, you may have some. I, she could keep calling her IBM like her name is IBM. I'm so sorry. I'm definitely here <laughs> representing my own views, but also happy to I'm speak sorry. as best as I can on IBM's behalf. But I'd actually like to share a quick personal story here, which is that when I was a young professional starting out in management consulting, the amount of time that I spent in the wee hours of the morning manipulating PowerPoint presentations to get them just right or Excel models to try to figure out whatever clever formula it was. I didn't get much sleep, and there was barely any time to bring critical insights to the table. I'm thrilled that a lot of these technologies are helping accelerate that. So again, I can focus on the strategic part of my job. And you talk about well-being. I mean, I don't have to stay up till 4 o'clock in the morning anymore. And uh, you could say I have to pay my dues, but I'm, I'm thrilled about the opportunity to unlock the more creative sides of, of our brains and our, our communities and, and work together on this. Um, I won't speak too much more um, on how it's tackling these big societal challenges because, I mean, there's, there's so many different applications. There's personalized medicine, diagnosing disease, again, what I talked about with communities that haven't had that access to that before. Um, yeah, there really is so much, um, so much opportunity here. And yes, we absolutely need to keep personal information safe. These are highly regulated industries. Um, that governance comes first and foremost. And if I may, just a pitch for, there's a new, there are all sorts of uh, businesses that are being created as a result of this in response to this mental health issue. So I have a colleague of mine here back in the room who's a part of an organization called Life Guides. And essentially, uh, in the social work context, it's take layered on top of EAP in many ways. And in some instances, it's the idea that 
chat GGPT, AI technology can actually enable the connection of people who have had similar experiences. So I'm going through a divorce, I'm not by the way, but if I were going through a divorce, as opposed to calling an EAP person who tells me, that's, that's fine and that's available, but what if I could be connected to another person who is going through the same experience, who's having the same experience, or who just came through that experience. It's a really interesting platform, and they're using generative AI and other tools to connect, to, to connect people so that you can talk to another human being, enabled by technology, and, and then use tools, and then it generates all sorts of readings for you, et cetera, as opposed to, so it's fascinating. That's a classic example of it. So I agreed to be the social impact chairperson of that because we truly do have a mental health crisis, and everyone, when you're going through it, you think you're doing it alone you, because of the stigma, et cetera. So imagine if you could be introduced to another person, if they're in Africa, if they're wherever they are on the planet, and you walk through that together, they guide you through their life. That's one new, invention and they're using generative AI to uh, enable that tool. And you may be aware we have a couple of programs at BU, an online master of social work, which we're kind of reimagining now and looking at new ways to, you know, sort of bring experiential learning and bring, you know, more integration in, also an online master of public health, right? And so looking at how, again, from an education standpoint, we build these kinds of resources and tools in. Okay. Um, we probably have time for one question or two quick questions. So there's a question in the back here. Mike. Hello, my Hello. name is Olga, and uh, I work at School of Theology Library at Boston University. It is one of the smallest library, and we have only nine, uh, actually eight, uh, librarians. Uh, we lost a uh, couple librarians since COVID. Somebody uh, got retired, somebody left the job. And so all volume of the uh, job was not related uh, before to, for example, to my duty uh, became part of my job. And uh, I started using ChatGPT and BART uh, in the library field. And I found that it's fantastic. Firstly, it works great for reference. Yes. Each librarian in our library has to spend two hours uh, per week at the reference desk answering to the questions. I don't have a theological education, and sometimes when students come and ask me something, firstly, I, I not only und don't understand what they're talking about, I, I, I don't know what, what it's all about, but you know, just few uh, questions and uh, I have a slightest idea. And uh, uh, most likely students ask to help them to find sources for paper. And uh, I use chat DPT and BART both uh, for. This is fantastic because chat GPT knows difference between primary sources and secondary sources. Uh, academic uh, journals, peer review journals, uh, recent publication, all publication. It's provide not only list of the publication. If I ask an additional question, please uh, outline number seven, it give the outline for, please provide me ISBN number, done. Thank so uh, it's enormous safe of time. Absolutely. The second is we lost the cataloger, professional cataloger. I studied cataloging at library school, but uh, I know how to do copy cataloging, but I don't have uh, much experience on the original cataloging, Thank especially you. in foreign, foreign book. So I asked Chat GPT, please create me uh, original cataloging in Library of Congress and such and such format. It's done. I had to make a few corrections. Uh, well, I have to know how to catalog, catalog should look like, and so I ask to make a few correction. It's done, perfect, perfect cataloging. So it's also save a lot of time. Uh, I made okay. a presentation. Sorry. I would like to wrap up because okay, we're, okay, we're really okay, going okay. against that. But um, I made the presentation for students and faculty at School of Theology, but uh, there was not really a positive outlook. Um, I think the students know more about ChatGPT and BART than, than, than faculty. 
and we have to work with faculty to convince them that chat GPT, it is not about plagiarism, it is not about shortcut, it's about different way of study, different uh, way of gathering, gathering knowledge. Thank you. Congratulations to you for really thinking through how we reimagine library services going yes. forward. I think that is so vital uh, to the success of our university and to the world. Thank you. I, I think we are over time, so I'd like to um, join you in thanking the panel for an, a great discussion. <laughs>